Well, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Um, just uh, it's nice to see you without a mask. I have noticed recently that I have patients who've actually never seen my face now, which is the reverse, because in the operating room, I used to come in and people didn't know who I was because I had a mask on and they knew me without a mask. Now I come in and they know exactly who I am because I have a mask on in the OR too. Uh, but I hope you're all staying safe. You're wearing masks and uh, you and your loved ones are being healthy during this COVID crisis, which has taken quite a toll on all of us. Um, I want to apologize. Well, I don't know if I want to apologize per se for my appearance. I'm a little scruffy today. Uh, it is uh, November, which is the uh, uh, Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, you know, prostate cancer is affecting one in uh, about one in nine uh, men uh, nationally with 100,000 new cases and about 33,000 deaths. So anything you can do to support uh, your uh, family or friends or the community or contribute to the, uh, the prostate cancer funds, I think would be uh, quite appropriate. We're going to talk about something a little bit uh, nicer than prostate cancer and talk a bit about uh, minimally invasive surgery and uh, arthritis surgery for hips and knees as well as engagement of some of the robotic tools that we have at our disposal now. Have an advancement problem. You're doing there. Uh, here are some disclosures. I do do consulting work with Stryker and they do make the Mako robot as we'll talk about uh, on several boards and a reviewer for many organizations. Rather advancing. Apologize, we're having a little um, advanced project. I work primarily here at Providence. Uh, we have a surgery center at Lakes, which we'll talk about. Uh, we've been here in, the, in this area for over 60 years. When Charlie Peretta came back to work uh, at Mount Carmel in the old Providence Hospital, and we've grown through there with Drs. O'Hara and Haynes, as some of you may remember. Uh, and now we have a growing team of, um, uh, of physicians, including pain, pain providers, spine providers, um, therapy, among other things. So we have a, the full service here and it's quite, quite a bit bigger than we used to be. Arthritis and hip and knees are quite common. Uh, basically, arthritis isn't a thing. It's not something you take out. Arthritis is wearing the car tire. So if the cartilage in your hip or knee were the tread of the tire, wearing it out, having your tire be somewhat bald or out of cant, that would represent the arthritis. And here's some examples, uh, if you can see the pointer, here's a joint space. Here you can see a nice open joint space here, bones touching bone. Uh, here's the wear and cartilage, and effectively that is the arthritic pattern that we're, we're treating. There's two phases to arthritis. One is the mechanical part, the actual wear, uh, and the breakdown of the cartilage. But in doing so, there's an inflammatory response, which is why people often have swelling, or what we call synovitis, or the tissue being swollen inside the knee. Uh, and that's why things like steroids will often help because it'll quiet down the inflammatory response. This is a picture of actually an animal uh, from one of our research projects, but you can see this nice thick blue part and the nice cellular structure of streaming cartilage cells coming down to the bone. Uh, this was an injury that we created, but this is really what you want it to look like, not this significant wear pattern that you're seeing there. Uh, there's still a very significant need for treatment for arthritis. The cost is well into the hundreds of billions of dollars a year in the United States. Uh, highest percentage of new patient presentations to primary care physicians, among others, uh, growing, growing, and growing. Uh, there's a significant morbidity from uh, anti-inflammatories with GI and renal function. And as you know, with the opioid, opioid crisis, we're really averse to using uh, the strong medicines uh, or the addictive medicines to treat arthritis in our general population. The Arthritis Foundation is an excellent organization. They've supported a lot of research work and development work to help treat arthritis in the community. Uh, you can see some, from some of the statistics here, uh, this is a very, very significant factor and something that has a very significant need for most all Americans and all of your friends and family. Let's talk about the knee for a bit. You can see here, uh, this picture, this is a knock knee. That's what we call valgus. This is a bow-legged knee. That's what we call varus. Two different patterns. The bow-legged one is the more common pattern. The knock knee one is a little bit different. The symptoms tend to be a little bit different with the knock knees uh, tending to be more unstable, sort of fatigued and worn out. I don't trust my knee. It gets sore, but I, it's really a problem functionally. 
the bow-legged ones tend to be more of what people talk about, pain, swelling, and difficulty with activities. We often use physical therapy. Uh, many of the insurers are mandating that now, <clears throat> but therapy is good. You know, therapy is often having a coach, someone to help you figure out what exercises you can do, how you can get your hip or knee moving, maybe help you quiet down some of the inflammatory response or some of the swelling, uh, get you out and get you going. Uh, here are some walking sticks. Nobody likes using a cane, but if you go to the sports store, they have a whole rack of walking sticks, people in Europe using them all the time. It'll help unload your hip or knee. It's not like using crutches or a walker. Looks cool, keeps you active and gets you going farther. I think anti-inflammatories are wonderful drugs as long as your family doctor thinks it's okay and you don't have a problem with your GI tract or your kidney function, as I mentioned. Uh, Advil is my favorite, but that's just me. Uh, Celebrex, Motrin, Naprosyn, Mobic. There's a, a myriad of different drugs. And if you can find one that, that agrees with you and helps your pain, it's very easy. And frankly, I'm not opposed to getting up in the morning or getting up before you're going to do an activity Taking a couple Advil, it may take the edge off and keep you doing more and going farther. We frequently use steroid injections. We use the gel shots, the hyaluronic acid. Um, sometimes we'll give bracing to support your knee or uh, bracing on the hips doesn't work so well. Um, and basically finding whichever strategy it is conservatively to keep you doing more for longer. And the most minimally invasive thing that we do is not operate. So I think it's important as you investigate what you're going to do to really use all of the non-operative solutions that you can first before you start moving and talking about operative treatments. Let me just talk about steroids for a minute because while I, I never thought I would be such an advocate, steroids actually are uh, somewhat of a wonder drug. Um, they're effective, often temporary, but many times you can get a cortisone shot and it can last you for many, many months. Uh, it decreases inflammation. It's almost like, <clears throat> excuse me, putting super Motrin into the knee. Uh, there is a limited number of applications. We generally don't like to give injections any more than every three months. I think if the medicine isn't really lasting you that long, then probably it's time to start looking at some other uh, ways to treat your problem. One thing I will say is, we do know that risk of infection after injections is a potential problem when you move to joint replacement. And for that reason, we have essentially a hard stop. If you get a shot, if you get a needle put into your knee or your hip, you should not be having an operative procedure where we're putting in metal and plastic for a minimum of 90 days. So if you get an injection, you are not having surgery on your hip or knee for at least 90 days. Hyaluronic acid, there's a number of different companies that make what we call the gel. The original gels were made from uh, the rooster coxcombs. Now some are recombinant, some are made from uh, bacteria. Uh, these have been around for many, many years and really were uh, popularized in the uh, veterinary industry. Uh, some of you may have heard me talk, my, my wife rides horses and we were arguing about these compounds several years ago as I was doing some uh, work in our lab and I wasn't really so enthused and she said they gave my horse the injection and the horse was lame after the injections the horse wasn't lame the horse is not going to lie so that it does something and you should do better and go figure out what uh, i will say i didn't really find out what the answer was but we use a lot of this uh, medicine uh, but we use it limited so you really want to have failed steroids or other injections these compounds are very expensive uh, and many of the insurers are limiting what we can do the, the key for this is if you get an injection of a hyaluronic acid, we really are expecting it to last at least six months. If it's not getting, getting you that long, uh, the insurers aren't going to let you get it again. And we don't really think the efficacy is getting you to where you want. There is a bit of a chance of reaction to that. So you should talk to your providers about that as well. <clears throat> We're getting a lot of questions about stem cells. So stem cells can be harvested from a myriad of different areas. It's sometimes unclear where people are getting their stem cells from. Some people are using them from donated stem cells from placenta or umbilical cord. Sometimes we'll just draw your blood and use this PRP that you can see, which is a buffy coat of the high uh, plasma rich uh, uh, proteins. Uh, you can use it from uh, bone marrow or you could use it from fat cells. All of them have some different advantages and disadvantages. In general, I would say it's 
it's a little bit of a hope and a prayer. It's not a panacea. Now, for younger people who still have some cartilage space left, who uh, can afford the extremely high cost because it's always out of pocket, uh, it may be worth a try. But I think for older people, when you have, if particularly if you have bone on bone arthritis, I think thinking that something injected into your knee is going to help biologically change your knee is a bit unreasonable. So you have to be a bit careful with what people are promising you and weigh the uh, risk benefit and cost relative to what's being promised. Arthroscopy is something people ask about all the time. Arthroscopy is not for arthritis. So as I said, you can't clean out arthritis because arthritis is a loss. So if you look at this bottom picture, this is an arthritic knee. And you can imagine I could shave this part and take, get rid of some of the fragments that are breaking off or up here, but we're not going to be putting back cartilage on this part of the knee. So we're not going to be changing very much with a better looking knee. So you can see this has good cartilage, this piece of meniscus, the padding between the knee bones is flicking out and that gets caught inside. So we can trim that off. Sometimes you can repair them, but by trimming that off, that piece doesn't get stuck inside the knee and we can get rid of that mechanical symptom. But once you're looking at things like this, you're too far and basically there's, it's, it's not a reasonable thing to expect that you could put a scope in the knee and help the arthritic pattern. So as that brings us through the, uh, most of the uh, conservative measures, then your surgeon or your provider is gonna start talking about joint replacement. Our goal with total joint replacement is to relieve pain. Our goal is to improve motion, improve mobility, and to improve function. I think the thing to remember is, think about you how you are now. If you wanna see that better, take some notes. Maybe have someone video you walking, pay attention to how far you can go, and when you're bothered. If and when or after you have the joint replacement, if you could refer back to those notes, you'll see how much better you're doing but we're not going to be taking you back to what you remember that you used to be. That would be an amazing thing. And I wish I could promise you that. <laughs> this is just a quick video of a, a knee, obviously a schematic, uh, taking away some of the bone and the cartilage. We trim off the ends of the bone, sort of chamfer it off. And then we put on a metal uh, femur and a metal tibia with a piece of plastic in between. And that recreates the joint bearing surface. We preserve your ligaments on the sides, the medial and lateral sides. And on the middle ones, uh, sometimes we'll leave the posterior, but we pretty much always sacrifice the anterior uh, cruciate ligament. There's probably now, this is a little bit of an aging uh, number. We're probably at a million, uh, a million total joints a year and well over 650,000. At least 15 year survival, we're probably pushing 20 plus year survival in 95% of cases and we're having good to excellent results in, in the vast majority of cases. Uh, when is the right age? Well, we used to say young was 70, then 60. Now we're saying the crossover is in the 50s. Um, but we really want to make sure that you've given it a good solid chance to be doing well before you go to the operating room and have exhausted uh, pretty much all of your uh, conservative options. Why do we talk about it so much? Well, patient satisfaction after total knees has been looked at uh, very critically over the last several years. What we found was that if you ask patients, were they happy? They often said that they were happy, but they weren't really satisfied. And that was kind of a weird social dilemma. Uh, we've started doing something called patient reported outcomes pros, starting to measure patients results, measuring through surveys, how they feel about their activity, their function and their pain before surgery and after surgery and then over time. So when you're asked to fill out some of these forms, while it may seem mundane or bothersome, these are very helpful to be able to track your progress. Often we can show it to you graphically and you can see how much better you're doing and compare it to what you were. And I think that gives you very good information to grade yourself moving forward. So what is minimally invasive? Well, minimally invasive is basically doing things minimally. We want to do surgery as least as we can. Generally, I tell people as little as we can, but as much as we need. Uh, what we've done a little bit is taken some lessons from our sports medicine colleagues and try to make the surgery more like an arthroscopy, more like outpatient, because we're doing outpatient total hips and right total knees right now. But what we've done is a partner with uh, 
the pain providers, partnering with anesthesia, uh, talking with nurses, therapists, and the, and the like, and we have a coordinated team. And so we're doing things both before and during and after your surgery to try to make the entire experience better. Our goal is to get you up and get you out and get you home very quickly. So if we can use injections in the OR or with anesthesia to give you a better pain relief, if we can give you uh, medicines that help control your nausea, if we can give you anti-inflammatories or preemptive dosing um, uh, pain medicines to really control uh, what your experience is, that's great. Now we do often give you narcotics after surgery, but we're very careful about how we prescribe them and we've really decreased the dosing of these because what we found is people when they're aware of what's going on and we do these behaviors before surgery the need for narcotics has gone way down and what we really don't want is people having a store of narcotics in their in their cabinets which can cause lots of problems for uh, young people and families and friends and you know that's been a, a big epidemic in the country right now um, as i said these, these, ta these uh, strategies have really changed our practice entirely. Uh, we're doing rapid rehabilitation, and right now we're doing outpatient surgery and is growing very, very rapidly. Tomorrow I'm doing four total knees at the Lake Surgery Center, which is a center we have with some other doctors up at Pontiac Trail and Haggerty. We have a robot there, which we'll talk about. And basically our surgeries, the Everyone will have the surgery there that day. They'll get up and walk on it. They'll work with a therapist. They'll go home the same day and sleep in their own bed. Keeps you out of the hospital relative to quality measures. We found that outpatient surgery at these, these facilities is exceptionally uh, uh, good relative to quality care. It's good for infection and it's good for rehab. So that's the, that's the, the direction we're headed right now, both for hips and for knees. And what I'll tell you is the insurance companies, including Medicare, have seen this and they're starting not to allow, uh, they're starting not to approve through pre-authorization inpatient stays. They've realized that we should be able to do this in many cases or most cases on an outpatient basis. And they are not authorizing, um, you know, the one, two, three night stays in the hospital anymore. So we're very careful about making sure we have a good plan beforehand because our goal is really to get you home quickly. All right, let's get into some of the nitty gritty. Uh, I'm asked a lot about partial knees. Uh, this is another schematic. You can see the arthritis is only on the inside part of the knee here. Uh, the disease cartilage then is resected. You can see in this one, this is one of those bow-legged varus knees and this is really the bad part. So instead of doing a whole knee, I can just do the inside part called a partial. Uh, here's an example of doing it through a small incision. This is a traditional approach. We'll talk a bit about robotics in a minute, but you can see here's just the metal and the plastic that goes on the inside part. Uh, potential advantages. Well, partials tend to have a little faster recovery. They tend to have better predictive range of motion. They tend to feel more natural and they tend to do better on stairs. Um, bad things. Well, it really is only addressing that inside part. So what I tell people is <clears throat> this is the box that you fit into when you have knee arthritis and you qualify for a partial. This big box is the box when you have knee arthritis and you qualify for a total. The partial box is inside the total box, but if you don't fit into this box down here, the outcome from the partial is not gonna be good. So you have to be very careful and really talk about it with your surgeon. Do I qualify? If I am qualified, what? what things make me well qualified. And if I don't qualify, why is that as well? Because you really want to understand what you're getting into in order to have a good outcome. We've made total knees again, uh, more minimally invasive. We use much smaller incisions than we used to do. It's rebounded a little bit. We got really small, which was a lot of pushing and tugging and we've expanded a little bit, but you can see here our instruments are, have gotten smaller. So they fit inside the knee. Uh, See if I can get that video to work. Don't think we're going to get that. Uh, but that just shows a uh, small incision. You can see we retract the patella. We don't flip it over like in this old picture here. And we that allows us to have better pain control, better um, recovery of the quadriceps muscles to get your function better quickly, and better uh, pain control because we are preemptive in, in controlling that. Knee replacements themselves have changed. 
So when we talk about modern knee design, what we would say is knees that are a little bit more narrower. We used to talk about women's versus knees, uh, uh, men's knees. We don't talk about that so much. We've used what we call anthropomorphic data. So uh, tracking large numbers of patients with the way their bones are shaped and making the knees fit them better. There's some kinematic properties. Uh, this was an example of one of the striker knees and what they call the get around knee because of the way the ligaments are balanced. But I'll tell you that all of the companies now are making very, very good knees. They're all very well validated. And the modern knees should work and last for many, many, many years. I'm using more uncemented knees. That's a technology that's actually been around since the 80s. Um, but now we have something called porous metal. So you can see the backside of this tibia which is titan pure titanium that's actually printed. It's a, a printing technology. Bone loves titanium. So if we can impact a knee into your bone like we see here, and I can get the bone to grow into it, it makes it very solid and it can last a very, very long time. There's some arguments about that philosophically, but you know when we use cement, cement's a grout, cement can break down, it gets very hot, it can burn. Um, and the hope is that by uh, using these technologies, we're making things even more minimalist by protecting your soft tissues and your bone and trying to get your bone to respond to the implant. Uh, but to do that, you have to have quite good quality bone. And so uh, it'll depend a little bit on your own anatomy. Just briefly well, uh, to chat about hip arthroplasty, uh, total hip arthroplasty, I believe more recently has been rated as the second best predictable satisfactory operation done, second only to cardiac surgery. And the only reason cardiac surgery exceeds hips is because they get a big bump because if you don't get your heart fixed, you can die. And that brings their quality scores up higher. Uh, John Charlie seen here is a, uh, a Brit. Uh, he design the, the implant that you can see above. And that led to uh, many, many hundreds of thousands, millions of patients having new hips with very rapid outcomes and very high satisfaction. Here's just a quick schematic. As we open the hip, uh, you can see the muscles being resected. Uh, we protect the muscles throughout the course of the hip. You can see the bone that was arthritic being removed. We use a small reamer to make the cup round, bang in a cup, uncemented. Almost all hips are unsubmitted right now in the United States. Uh, the bone grows into it, do the same on the femur. Typically now, instead of a metal head, we would use a ceramic head for better longevity and um, bearing surface technology, and then uh, get you up and moving right away. Hips are re really remarkable. It is quite common that I will see a patient in the post-op recovery unit, and they will tell me that the pain they had before surgery is gone. They get up and walk on it and can can go, go, go. It is, it is an amazing procedure. When we talk about MIS hips, uh, the key was basically being protective of the soft tissue because here are some of the uh, smaller incisions. I won't tell you everyone's going to have an incision that small. A lot will depend on how actually how big you are. Um, we are much more protective of how we're treating the tissue. We try to uh, either go between fibers or move fibers. Uh, sometimes we'll use internervous planes protecting the function. And basically by over the last 40 years, we've learned by staying out of certain areas around the hip, protecting certain areas of the hip, that the pain relief and the function are much uh, better and recover much quicker. We talk about uh, single incision. Here's an example. I hope these slides aren't too gross. But you can see we have to have things big enough to get the head out. But they've shown that these have very fast recovery. But when you measure people's recovery, after you get to about six to 12 weeks, everything sort of flattens out and you don't, there's not a lot of change that are after from more traditional methods. So the key with these is, like I said, doing as much as you need, but as little as you can. We don't wanna sacrifice getting implants in in the correct orientation or in the correct rotation in lieu of having a small uh, incision. People are talking a lot about the direct anterior approach. It's done in about 13% of cases nationally. That hasn't really grown in the last five or six years. It's an approach that was actually developed in the 40s. Uh, I'll say in full disclosure, I don't really like that approach for a number of different reasons, but it is an inner nervous approach. You can see it's a little bit more what we call uh, toward the front of the hip. Um, and you just come, you're coming from sort of the other side. The advantage is 
maybe it has a little bit quicker recovery in the first two weeks. That hasn't really been validated. Um, there are some negatives. There's a nerve there that can cause some numbness. There is a little bit higher episode of bleeding and there's a little bit higher episode of fractures. That being said, if you have an experienced surgeon who does a lot of these and he likes doing it that way, listen to your surgeon because the outcome from an anterior approach can really be really exceptional. Why do we keep talking about different things? Well, when we do registries, and I'm gonna talk about the Michigan registry in a minute, there's still lots of problems. Even if you have 95% of people being happy, that means 5% of people might be having a problem and 5% of a million is still a lot of people. The biggest problems we're seeing right now in knees is in our infection and um, instability. In hips, fractures, because people are getting older and when people fall, they break. Uh, and we still worry about things like dislocation and loosening. We don't have the problems with wearing out the bearings like we used to have. And it's interested in teaching residents. Uh, the residents right now pretty much don't see what we call the wear debris phenomenon that I trained with uh, through my entire younger career. Because of these things, people have worked hard on developing other ways to put in implants. Uh, robotics and navigation and custom implants have been around for a long time. Here's just some examples. Uh, this here is a uh, uh, patient specific guide. We're not using a lot of these in the US right now. You would uh, take a CT scan and then create some jigs that fit to your hip or knee directly. And then we would make cuts based on that. This is an example of a navigation unit, which I'm gonna show you again in a minute. And this is one of my colleagues uh, uh, doing a, uh, a navigation device. You can see we're watching on the screen uh, as we're going to prepare the knee. This is actually one of the early robots. Um, we do use a navigation for both hips and knees. Our navigation has been around for a, quite a long time. It is, was more broadly used in Europe. Uh, the American surgeons didn't engage it very much. It was a bit cumbersome. Many people thought they could do just as well on their own, but we studied this. And what we found was in the operating room, when you have um, exam pictures like this, and when I would track what we had, you could see from the screen and the computer would tell me when I made my cut and I could measure my cut after that, it would tell me, did you cut it straight or did you cut it crooked? And, you know, sometimes we try to cut it, not quite perfect, but it would help image and tell me. People didn't always believe it. So when people don't believe me, I like to use science. Science is good, despite what you may hear uh, sometimes on TV. But here's a, just an example of two studies we did. And what we did is... We took the patients that we did navigated, we took the patients that we did non-navigated, and then we measured their x-rays after. And you can sort of see here that the curves changed. And what we found was when we took the navigated versus the non-navigated, we narrowed the curve and we got rid of some of the outliers. What we found with time, however, was that as physicians' volumes went up and for high volume skilled surgeons, it was really hard to prove that the navigation was better. Uh, what it did prove is for lower volume surgeons, uh, you could narrow that curve and bring people into a good quality alignment. But with the higher volume surgeons, uh, the, their, their curves were already pretty narrow. So it was hard to prove that effect. The navigation devices, again, were cumbersome and expensive. So uh, most of us sort of moved away from it. That was until the robots came. So, uh, and uh, this is a striker device and I do some work in our lab with striker, but uh, the robots are out. There's about, uh, you know, several hundred. This is uh, even more. There are about 100,000 procedure, more procedures done. There's almost 1,000 MAKO units in the country. Uh, most of them are being done by on knees, although you can certainly do them on hips. And uh, one of my former uh, trainees, Jonathan Vidorczyk, is a leader at, uh, at Hospital for Special Surgery in doing these. Uh, I'm very proud of his work, actually. Uh, but let me just show you some pictures. So the, the goal is taking a CT scan ahead of time, creating a, a, a surgical plan that is specific to that patient. We can do range of motion measurements interoperatively. Most of that is with hips. We can use the robot uh, to make our bone cuts so that the cuts are very precise. And then we put the implants in and check them, having the robot tell us, yes, you got them where you wanted to. If I choose to alter my plan, I can do that. And the robot is much more accurate in affecting a change in plan uh, for a patient in particular. So our goal is having a consistent and reproducible result and having precision. Again, the argument would be 
high volume surgeons who are skilled likely can't achieve that with their more traditional devices. So far, we've shown that the robot certainly is as good. It's very hard to then take those people and show that you're getting a better outcome. I will say there are certain patients where I think the robot clearly has advantages because it allows me to perhaps alter my plan intraoperatively. Then there's some people where it may not make so much difference. But I think by having a plan and being able to execute that plan, that certainly is a a, a very strong move forward relative to technology. Uh, here's just some pictures. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, you create these models with the CT scan. You can see this is a model that I would see intraoperatively. And when I feel the balance of the knee, I may say, let's just change this by one degree of angle, put that into the computer, and then the robotic arm helps me cut that very precisely. I can tell you doing that manually takes a lot of practice and surgeons who are very good can do it, but I don't know that it's as price or as precise or as well managed or well measured as with the robot. Um, you have that intraoperative assessment. So when I measure the ligament balance, I get some feedback rather than just me feeling it myself. I've done lots of knees. So my feel generally does match what the robot's telling me. And again, after I execute the plan, the robot arrays will give me feedback and tell me what I, what I want to know. Now, the thing is being looked at now, and there's several studies, uh, Farah uh, Fer Sadad from London uh, and his colleagues, so, uh, Rothman Institute, Hospital for Special Surgery, among others, uh, take it backwards, have um, produced a, a number of different uh, studies. And the things that are intriguing is with the robot, since it won't let you cut outside the line, it looks like there may be a little less soft tissue damage it looks like the alignment predictably is that you're hitting the mark that you're trying to achieve. Uh, the hope is that people will have less pain. There's a couple of studies that show that you may have less pain. And then the obvious hope is people will have a faster recovery. All of this data is being generated um, quite rapidly. I will say you have to take some of that in, uh, with a grain of salt because much of it has been sponsored by Stryker. But all of the companies right now, Zimmer, Smith & Nephew, uh, Stryker, uh, all have some form of robot that they're promoting because this is clearly the direction that the future is taking us. I just want to take the last few slides to tell you some good things that are happening in Michigan at large and things that the core Institute have been uh, are very active in helping uh, to drive. Uh, in Michigan, through a collaboration with Blue Cross Blue Shield, we have the Michigan Arthroplasty Registry Quality Collaborative Initiative. This is an initiative which is uh, statewide. It is funded by Blue Cross, although they've really allowed us to run with it and they've stayed out of the management services. Right now we're tracking implants put in in uh, almost 96% of all cases in the state. It's 65 hospitals, over 300,000 cases, 500 surgeons. And basically every time a case is done, that case is tracked by trained nurses for the first 90 days. And then we track the a life of the implant, when people have revisions, when they return to the OR over the lifetime of the implant. That has given us some really, really exciting information. And we've used this to do some projects for quality, decreasing transfusion rates. We spearheaded that here at Providence. We've decreased the transfusion rate down low enough that we have stopped uh, drawing blood banking labs before surgery because the, it's, uh, we, we just don't need to get it done. Uh, we've reduced and changed our readmission process. We've changed where people go. So now we know that going to nursing homes is clearly a very bad idea, it increases your complication rate risk significantly. In fact, um, I guess I'm kind of mean. If you told me you wanted to go to a rehab center, which is a nursing home, I probably would tell you I won't do your operation because that gives you a 20%, at least from this data, a 20% increased risk, risk of complication, and there's essentially no operation that I do right now that has that sort of complication factor. Uh, we do do some internal quality reporting. <clears throat> this is a graph showing uh, all the surgeons that were participating. That's me, the yellow dot. That showed that for uh, the revision rate for, this, for the case sample that we we're looking, I was within the confidence quality limits. We use this to help educate surgeons and work with the hospitals to make sure that physicians are getting, getting good feedback from the registry so that they can know we can improve the care of patients and 
and what we want to do is make Michigan the best place in the world to have an arthroplasty procedure. A lot of information, and I want to make sure we left plenty of time for uh, questions. I think in short, don't believe propaganda. Be careful on the internet. If it looks too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. Uh, talk to your surgeon, talk to your friends, uh, get good information and make good decisions. Uh, joint replacements have very good and very reliable outcomes, but to get those off the meat, you have to modify comorbidities, uh, manage your uh, hemoglobin A1C for diabetics, bring down your uh, BMI if you're, have, if you're overweight, work on some prehabilitation and strengthening, all these sorts of factors which will make your recovery and make your outcome that much better. MIS surgery or minimally invasive surgery, is, it's essentially the norm right now. It's what we're all doing. We're doing everything we can to have you have less pain and better function and a more rapid recovery. And in short, we're getting a very, very good long-term success. And the hope is that you have one operation and have it last you for the rest of your life. With that, I wanna thank you for your attention. Uh, Sarah's taking questions online. I think she's gonna take me off screen and then we're gonna to try to answer some of these questions live. Are you gonna leave me on video or take Yeah. Me? Yeah, all right. Uh, short answer, yes. Uh, long answer, a little bit of a philosophic issue. I will say for my practice, I used to do what we call bilateral knees all the time. I really moved away, away with, uh, from it because some of the data on medical outcomes show the, a higher complication rate doing both at once. Um, generally, I have found, this is me speaking, that do the worst one first, get you up and going, if everything going well, we can do the other one in rapid sequence. It's a, sort of a less of a hit. And I, I've never really liked the concept that if we do both at once and we have a problem with one side, it really negatively affects both sides. Um, the other thing is, it's often the case that one side isn't as bad. And once you fix the worst side, the good side, we may buy a couple of years because you're feeling better and you have a good side to go with. If somebody asked me before surgery, can I kneel on my knee replacement? My answer is you are allowed to kneel on your knee replacement and you can do whatever is comfortable. I also then tell people, if you use me as an example, I have a fat butt. and My butt is really good for sitting and is well padded. My knee on the other hand, I don't know if you can hear that, that's my knee. My knee is not well padded. So that's why often if you did want to kneel, if you kneeled on a cushion, like on a chair, or you bought a little volleyball knee pad, so you or a gardening cushion, it may give you more comfort. Sometimes it hurts just because of the direct pressure. Sometimes it hurts because when we kneel, we often try to then sit back on our heels and you're, you're sort of pulling and stress, stressing the knee. Um, but there's no prohibition about kneeling itself. I, I just, I can't tell you, and we're very, very, unreliable in predicting who's going to have a good experience kneeling after surgery and who's not. If the question is, what restrictions would we give you? You have no restrictions. Once you're healed, you can do anything you want. You can do any activity you like. You know, Try not to fall down, stay off of ladders and don't do silly things. Uh, if it's what will you be able to do? That's a totally different kind of questions. Um, you know, the best measure for what you'll be able to do after surgery is what you're able to do currently. The goal is to make your current function better, not to give you different function that you had. So uh, as an example, I had a patient recently, very happy with their, I think this one was a hip. Uh, same conversation with an E and said, I, I, I can't run. And I was sort of surprised. And I said, well, when was the last time you were able to run? He said, oh, I haven't been able to run for over 20 years, but I thought when I got a hip, I'd be able to run again. So, you know, that's just a, you know, I like, the, I like the, I like the motivation and if you could run, it's okay. I just don't think the expectation should be to do things that you don't currently do. We want you to be able to do your current functions with less pain and better. The best predictor of motion after a knee replacement 
is the preoperative range of motion before the knee replacement. So if you have a very stiff knee before surgery, we hope we can improve your motion after surgery. Usually you will, but it may not flex all the way. If you want to go for pure numbers, you know, in the early days, we would say 95 to 100 degrees was adequate because that was enough to ride a bike and get up and down the stairs. Now I would say, you know, if someone's not hitting about 120, they're, they're not so happy. They're not unhappy, but they're not so happy. Um, and, but there's relative to the mechanics of the knee, you can, it can flex as far as you'll tolerate. You know, there are some other factors. Some, some women particularly have, are really thin. Their knees flex really far. Uh, sort of like the picture of the uh, Japanese gentleman doing squatting on a tatami mat. That's very hard to reproduce because, you know, soft tissue and other things can get in the way. When people have heavier legs, you know, don't forget as your knee bends, your calf starts to hit your thigh. So you may have some limitation there relative to the soft tissues instead of the mechanics themselves. But effectively, um, the, the, the mechanics are not limited in that re in regard and what you, what you have naturally is going to be your limitation. A little bit variable. I think the, the, I usually tell people the first six weeks are the key and that's the hardest point. When you hit six weeks, uh, if everything went well, you'll probably be at about, I'll say 80%. So you'll be bending better. You'll be walking better. Uh, you'll, you're, but you'll still be getting fatigued uh, and you may still be getting sore with time. The next six weeks, you ramp it up. At three months, you should be pretty much there, but then you start having some other things that people, I will say, complain about. My knee's feeling better, but I get really tired when I go shopping at the store. Because you used to not be able to go shopping at the store. And so when you used to go to the store, you'd go for a few minutes or go for 10, 15 minutes, whatever. And you'd need to sit down because your knee or hip would get sore. And now that your knee or hip are better, you're walking farther and you start to fatigue because it takes a long time to build up the stamina and muscle strength that you lost over many years. It's much like training for marathons, you know? So over, you know, after the first three months, it's a slow ramp, you get stronger and stronger. And I think you'll get better and better and better over the next two years. But the biggest change point is six weeks to three months. That's correct. The uh, structure and kinematics of the knee joint that we put in the shape of the bearing surface on the femur versus the shape of the plastic gives some natural uh, stability. It's made that way. Um, and so the anterior cruciate, you don't need in a total knee at all. The posterior cruciate, whether you keep it or not, would depend on the particular design of the implant. Even if you but, but even if you do keep it, most knees are, are actually designed that if it, if it failed, that the knee would still do fine. Absolutely. I can't explain it. I don't know if it's bariatric, barometric pressure, but, you know, there's a reason why Phoenix, Arizona is the fastest growing city in the country and why uh, the core student in Phoenix cannot have enough guys because there's so many new patients. Because in Phoenix, it's hot and it's dry and your joints don't hurt so much. That's why we have snowbirds. So, um, but I think there's some strategies for that. So it's not a bad thing, it's a nuisance, but it may be that that's where some of the topical creams, if you have a, if one joint is worse than another, you know, the Volterran cream that's over the counter and aspirin cream seem to do really well. This may be where, you know, this week I take a couple Advil in the morning. All those sorts of strategies are, are, are good. You know, uh, hot baths, warm soaks, all those things, things that, you know, your grandmother used to talk about and you can't believe that you're doing it yourself now. I get it. So uh, I'll hedge this a little bit. Part of it depends which robot you're using and how that robot is functioning. For the Mako device, there are two what we call tracker pins that through some poke holes you would put in the bottom bone, the tibia bone. There's two more that have to go in the top bone, the femur bone. 
on the femur. Sometimes we put them through the skin. Sometimes we put them in the wound. But yes, we need those to attach the, uh, what would they call the arrays that communicate with the computer outside of where we're operating. Um, yes, it's not common, but anytime you cut the skin, there's a chance of infection. And anytime we drill a hole into the bone, there's a chance of having a problem like a fracture. Those are pretty uncommon, um, but definitely a risk factor. Uh, it would depend on your x-rays, your exam, your ligament capability, your ligament constructs, and your pain pattern. Parsh in partials, you actually keep all four of your ligaments. So unless you're in London, England, most US surgeons believe you shouldn't do a partial if you don't have an anterior cruciate ligament. So if you're an old athlete and tore your ACL, you're probably not getting a partial. If all your ligaments are intact, then we wanna make sure you have what we call unicompartmental disease. So disease only on one part of the knee. That could be the inside, the outside, or the kneecap. We have partials for all of them. Uh, we wanna make sure your pain pattern fits that x-ray pattern. We wanna make sure your exam pattern fits that x-ray pattern. This is the things that are putting you into that box. So this is something that you and your surgeon would talk about. Now, some physicians just philosophically don't like partials and they'll tell you that. Um, but I think it's okay to ask, am I a candidate for a partial? They'll tell you yes or no and they'll tell you why.